Hey church, welcome to Deuteronomy chapter 3 and 4. Moses is in the heat of the moment in this sermon. The sermon began already in Deuteronomy chapter 1, and it's going to continue right through Deuter- uh, to chapter 4 verse 40. And you'll recognize then in verse 41, it's just like a little note. And then in verse 44, kind of as an intro to sermon number 2, we start that tomorrow. So here in the close of this sermon in chapter 3, maybe I'll just comment, make a point comment here. In chapter 3 verse 6, when it talks about them destroying every city of their enemy here, including men, women, and children, if that is something that bothers you and you're starting to question what's God's character behind that, we will address that question, just not today. And I'm looking forward to it because there is a very good answer for that. And we'll address that at a different date. What I want to park on here a little bit and point out is that in verse 11, they come across this, the bed of this man named Og and it's 13 foot long bed. Assumedly, he must have been a very, very tall man and depending on whether or not his feet were hanging over the end of the bed and all that, whatever. He's a big man and would have been a threat. And Moses is essentially saying, remember how your forefathers were scared of these giants? It was actually an unwarranted fear because of who God is. A similar thing happened in Acts chapter 4 in the New Testament church when they were also had, they had threats against them of being arrested and flogged and equally difficult things and challenging things. And what did they say? They said, Lord, enable your, consider these threats and enable your servants to carry out your mission with boldness. That's the kind of thing you and I could do today. We could say, Lord, here are the threats that are against me. Here's Og, here's how big this threat is, here's how big his bed would be, whatever the threat is. And then, Lord, would you now fill me with your power and enable your servant to continue your mission with boldness. Then, um, you could continue on here and recognize that Moses is always saying, like in verse 3, verse 26, he says, because of you guys, I'm not going to the promised land. (laughs) Three times he does that, once in chapter 1, once it's going to be in chapter 4. But recognize this, Moses still has to carry the weight of his own actions, but he is getting at something here. There is a cost to leadership. And the fact is this church, every one of us has been called to leadership of one kind or another, whether you're leading maybe some friends, some people in your household, or maybe in a bigger area of ministry, but there's a cost to it. And you could already ask this question, am I willing to pay the cost of leadership. And then if you get into chapter 4, and I brought my tablet with me today because I took a bunch of notes in here and there's no way I was getting that on a piece of paper. I just want you to see how Moses ends this sermon. So in chapter 4, um, the sermon is going to end in verse 40. And you'll recognize if I just kind of pick it up in chapter 3 verse 24 for instance, I want you to think about, and there's so many good things in here, there's no way we can even touch on them all. But think about how many times Moses tells his listeners who God is. Not even just what he's done or what he's going to do or what the people need to do, but who is God. In verse 24, maybe grab your Bible and follow along and I'll just rattle some of these things off. In chapter 3 verse 24, he is a miracle working God. In chapter 3 26, he's a terrifyingly righteous judge. In 4 verse 1, he's a provider of their home, their land. In verses 3 and 4, again, a terrifyingly righteous judge. Verse 6, he's a God who makes himself known to the nations. Verse 7, he's near us when we pray to him. Verse 12, he's a God who speaks and you've heard him. You can hear Moses saying it. Verse 13, he makes his will known and he wants to be known. In verse 15 to 19, he's a jealous God and will not tolerate worship of idols. Verse 20, he's a rescuer he, and for the purpose of being close to his people. Verse 23, He's the covenant maker and initiator of the covenant. He wants relationship. Verse 24, but he's a jealous God. Again, that's why no idols are allowed. Verse 25 to 28, in fact, he's a God who disciplines idolatry justly and severely. Verse 31, he's also a God who's merciful and doesn't forget his people. In verse 33, again, he says he's a God who speaks. And then in verse 34, he's a God who shows his miraculous power through his people. And then in verse 35, his name is the Lord. There is no other God. Verse 36, he speaks from heaven and allows you to hear it here on earth. Verse 37, he's going to deliver you by the very strength of his presence. And then verse 38 to 40, he concludes the sermon with this thought. Take to heart that the Lord, the one true God, is worth obeying because he is God. 
And it's in his very nature to bless those who acknowledge him as that. Church, that's the end of his sermon. Why would you preach that? Consider this. Moses is of almost double the age of everyone he's speaking to, and he's not one with them. He wants them, when they get to that promised land, when he's no longer their leader, he wants them to obey for this reason. Not because they were just following Moses, but because they were recognizing who is God. It's the same thing for us today. We need to recognize when we train our kids, this is how we live because of who God is. When we're teaching in the church, Sunday school class, sermons, youth group, whatever, this is why we practice the things we do, because who God is. So that when a new leader comes in place, he just says, says the same thing, because who God is doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Celebrate that church. And then I just want to just point out one more thing. In verse 37 of chapter 4, um, he talks about how God is going to drive, uh, drive out before you the nations who are greater and stronger than you. He's going to do it by his presence. And that just reminds me of some other verses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It talks about how uh, Jesus is going to overcome Satan by the splendor of his coming. In other words, by his presence. In John 18, the mob that was arresting Jesus, they fell down when he said, I am he, because they encountered his presence. In Exodus 33, Moses preferred to be in the desert with God's presence rather than be in the promised land without it. There's a precious, precious thing is God's presence. Then we could ask this question, Jesus, what is one step that I can take today to enjoy your presence more? And then park there with Jesus and do that. (laughs) Enjoy it.